ลำดับถัดไปดิฉันขอนำทุกท่านเข้าสู่เซสชั่น Inspiring Talks on Sustainability ซึ่งจะขอดำเนินรายการเป็นภาษาอังกฤษค่ะ While we are waiting for the stage to be set, let me briefly run through afternoon's program. We will have three interesting sessions. The first session will be inspiring talk from leaders in the field of sustainability. This will be followed by a panel discussion among CEOs of commercial banks about how they promote sustainable development of Thai economy. And today's event will end with closing remarks by Governor. Let's now move on to the next session, inspiring talks on sustainability, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Please feel free to send in any question you may have. We are honored to have with us four distinguished speakers, whom I would now like to invite on stage. Ms. Jeannie Stam, Head of Asia Sustainable Finance of Worldwide Fund for Nature. Dr. Ma Jun. Dr. Ma Jun, Director of Center for Finance and Development of Tsinghua University. <laughs> Ms. Sarani Ashwa Nantakun, Managing Director of South Forest. And Mr. Andrew Cross, Assistant Chief Financial Officer of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Without further ado, may I start the session with Ms. Jeannie Stam. Hope you can all hear me and hope you all had a wonderful lunch. So good afternoon, distinguished guests. I'm honored to represent WWF here today at the launch of the Thai Responsible Lending Guidelines. This is very timely given the urgent existential threat facing humanity from the degradation of natural capital and climate change. Thailand and the rest of the world are living with this clear and present danger. So let's look at what Thailand and the region are facing. Deforestation and burning account for 20% of GHG emissions, which cause climate change. The agroforestry sector is a key driver. The way we use land to grow food and fiber comes back to bite as climate change threatens our food security. Chronic changes in weather create shorter growing periods lower yields and lower nutrient density. More intense droughts and floods destroy crop outputs and cause soil erosion, which further reduces soil fertility. Climate change reduces populations of insects and birds, which provide pollination services. In April this year, PM 2.5 levels in North Thailand reach hazardous levels, caused partly by burning to clear farmland. In 2015, Indonesia faced its worst haze crisis from land clearing, which also affected Singapore and Malaysia. The carbon emissions from the fires in Indonesia were occurring at a higher daily rate than the entire US economy. The haze has returned this year, and we wait with bated breath to see how bad it might get. Environmental degradation and climate change are causing health risks through air pollution, heat stress, and disease. During this year's haze in Thailand, schools in Bangkok were shut down and businesses were affected. Hotels in Chiang Rai saw bookings drop by 20%. The 2015 haze in Indonesia caused deaths there and a spike in respiratory infections in Singapore and Malaysia. Coal-fired power plants are another source of severe air pollution in ASEAN. Europe and Japan saw unprecedented heat waves this year with people dying. Singapore had the driest and second hottest July ever. The ILO projected that in 2030, heat stress will reduce global working hours by 2.2%, causing economic losses of 2.4 trillion, 
and this will be largely borne by lower middle and low income countries. ASEAN fits into that category. The agriculture sector will account for 60% of working hours lost, further worsening our food security. A billion more people could be exposed to mosquito-borne viruses like dengue and Zika by 2080 if global warming continues at current rates. Climate change is causing physical risks through floods, sea level rise, droughts, and changes in rainfall patterns. According to the World Bank, nearly 40% of Bangkok may be inundated by 2030 due to more extreme rainfall. In 2011, Thailand encountered its worst flood crisis in 70 years, with economic losses of 42.7 billion, affecting the agriculture, automotive, and electronic sector. GDP growth was slashed from 2.6% to 1%. In the 2017 floods, only 10% of the $300 million damage was insured. Sea level rise threatens up to 50% of agricultural land in the Mekong Delta, and yields in the Delta may decline up to 26% for certain crops due to changes in rainfall patterns. Drought has also been a significant issue for Thailand, Record dry spells in 2016 and again this year have significantly impacted the country's agriculture sector. From January to June this year, rice exports fell by nearly 20% compared to last year. This is a serious threat to regional food security, given Thailand's role as the world's second largest exporter of rice. Staying with the water theme, ocean systems are at risk of collapse due to overexploitation climate change and pollution. Thailand is very dependent on the blue economy and its asset base of fish stocks, coral reefs, and coastal habitats. The tourism sector accounts for almost 12% of Thai GDP, employing over 6 million people. In 2016, 10 popular dive sites were shut down due to the coral bleaching crisis. In 2018, the government shut down Maya Bay due to extensive environmental damage. This had a huge impact on local operators from the loss of revenues and the loss of jobs. Coastal zones and mangroves provide food and income for local people. In Southeast Asia, reef-based fisheries generate annual incomes of about $2.4 billion. For Thailand, UNEP estimated that the annual economic value of mangroves are around $3.5 million per square kilometers. And Thailand is one of the world's largest fishery exporters, with the fishing and seafood sector contributing $6.6 .6 billion to exports in 2017 and employing more than 600,000 people. Now, the finance sector has taken false comfort that the economic losses from climate change and environmental degradation will be insured and have minimal credit impact. The reality is that since the 1980s, as extreme weather events have become more frequent and severe, weather-related insurance losses have risen five-fold, and uninsured losses have grown steadily. A recent modeling exercise by the rating agency S&P suggested that the insurance industry may still be underestimating possible losses from extreme weather by as much as 50%. In 2017, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, AXA CEO made the now famous remark that a four degree warmer world would be uninsurable. Recently, he reiterated that property assets with basements from New York all the way through to Mumbai will become uninsurable at a three degree warming scenario within the next 10 years. The insurance system acts as the economy shock absorber. Munich Re is already warning that climate change may cause premiums to become unaffordable for businesses. Without the ability to insure against catastrophic loss, the global credit system cannot function. Climate change has already impacted the ability of vulnerable countries to fund climate adaptation, creating a vicious cycle. A 2018 study of 48 climate vulnerable countries, including Vietnam, Philippines, and Cambodia, found that climate vulnerability resulted in higher interest payments on sovereign and private debt of $62 billion over the last 10 years. Government budgets are strained by disaster recovery efforts 
and the lower sovereign rating make it harder to fund climate adaptation to build resilience. A recent study by WWF and Investec Asset Management highlighted that how a country uses or abuses its natural capital will influence the resilience and volatility of its long-term growth. This impacts a government's ability to generate revenues to repay its debt and hence its sovereign credit rating. Natural capital acts as an insurance protection against climate change. So the environmental degradation from unsustainable business practices exacerbates the impact of climate change to create a double whammy on the wealth of a nation. Climate change and environmental degradation will have detrimental impacts on people, businesses, and countries. More people will face food, water, and job insecurity. Our health will suffer because of pollution, disease, and malnutrition magnified by the effects of worsening poverty. Businesses will be less profitable because of cost increases due to higher cooling needs, disruptions from water and raw material shortages, and lower labor productivity due to illness and heat stress, and loss of market share if they cannot meet their buyers' requirements. Countries will have higher borrowing costs and lower economic growth and tax revenues as businesses get hit. At the same time, social spending pressures and the risk of civil unrest increase as people suffer. The best and only insurance policy we have is to protect the natural capital assets which form the bedrock of our economy. These assets produce ecosystem services such as climate and air quality regulation, food, raw material and freshwater provision that all people and businesses depend on to survive and thrive. Nature is essential. For example, more than two billion people rely on wood fuel for their primary energy needs. Four billion people rely on natural medicines for healthcare. Marine and terrestrial ecosystems sequester 60% of carbon emissions. And most food and cash crops depend on animal and insect pollination. The recent IPBES report notes that up to $577 billion of annual global crop output is at risk due to pollinator loss. And the 2018 WWF Living Planet report estimated that ecosystem services or benefits provided by nature to the global economy are worth $125 trillion per year, which is two-thirds more than global GDP. So effectively, these are off-balance uh, off sheet assets that we all depend on, and not maintaining and investing in them will result in a drying up of our cash flows and our ability to survive. And this is why we need the finance sector to align its loan and investment portfolios to science-based standards for carbon, water, and biodiversity to ensure we live within planetary boundaries. Financial institutions can use free geospatial data and tools to measure and mitigate their risk exposure and reduce their negative impacts on environment and society. In doing so, the finance sector protects and invests in the natural capital that underpins the cash flows needed for debt repayment and value creation. And thereby, it boosts its own resilience to climate and environmental shocks and helps to prevent these from materializing in the first place. There are significant opportunities to finance the transition to sustainable economies. There is money to be made through creative, innovative financing solutions to mobilize capital. Public sector finances alone are not enough to achieve the SDGs and the goals of the Paris Agreement. In Asia, the Business and Sustainable Development Commission estimates there is five trillion in investment opportunities between now and 2030, and this is estimated to create 230 million new jobs. Specifically in ASEAN, a UNEP FI DBS study last year suggests there is three trillion in investment needs between now and 2030 for renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable agriculture, and infrastructure. Some banks have gotten on to this and are using sustainability-linked loans to support their clients. For example, two of WWF's corporate partners, HSBC and Walmart, jointly created a financing program to incentivize Walmart suppliers to reduce their GHG emissions. The cost of loans to suppliers is reduced 
as the suppliers make stepwise progress to meet Walmart's science-based target of reducing one gigaton of GHG emissions across its global value chains. Suppliers can participate by making commitments across various fronts, such as energy or deforestation. Many Walmart suppliers are based in Southeast Asia, and in order to keep their B2B contracts with Walmart, they have to make the necessary changes, and here they are being supported by the finance sector to do so. Banks are developing innovative financial products for business activities that also conserve natural capital. These are good examples of how banks can partner with NGOs. For example, ADB launched a $5 billion Oceans Financing Initiative designed with WWF to support business opportunities that foster healthy oceans and sustainable blue economies. The initiative will be piloted in Southeast Asia. The funds can be used to crowd in private capital by reducing the technical and financial risks of projects and promoting the use of instruments such as first loss guarantees and credit enhanced blue bonds. The $1 billion responsible commodities facility will issue green bonds to raise funding to provide low cost loans to 600 farms to grow crops on already cleared or degraded land to avoid further deforestation. The facility will finance the production of over 180 million tons of deforestation-free soy and corn worth over $43 billion over the next decade. And it will restore 1.5 million hectares of natural habitat in the Cerrado. And the facility is overseen by a committee that includes environmental NGOs. So NGOs are not that scary. You can actually work with them. And WWF is not going to make a credit card advertisement like Citibank. But you do, I, I do urge you to take a look at our latest credit card related um, advert, which shows that us humans are consuming the equivalent plastic as one credit card a week. So we have a great video showing you all the different ways in which you consume plastic through air, the food, and water. Now, regulators and supervisors understand the material risks to the finance sector from climate change and environmental degradation, as well as the huge role the sector must play. The NGFS that you heard about this morning was launched to promote best practices on managing climate risk and mobilize capital for green and low carbon investments. Five Asian supervisors have signed up, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Japan, and China. And between April last year and March this year, there were 23 speeches by central banks, including the Bank of Thailand, that referenced climate change. This is on central bankers' agendas. At this year's spring meetings of the World Bank and IMF, finance ministers from over 20 countries launched a new coalition to drive collective action on climate change. The coalition endorsed the six Helsinki principles, one of which is, again, mobilizing private sources of climate finance by facilitating investments and developing a financial sector which supports climate mitigation and adaptation. The calls to action cannot be any louder. Banks must lend their weight to support the low carbon sustainable transition. In light of the existential and urgent threats faced by all of us, and taking inspiration from the encouraging steps taken thus far. There is only one way forward. We must work together in a pre-competitive manner, all of us in the room today, with no time to spare, and harness the power of the finance sector to play a critical role to finance sustainable development through innovative green and blue financial solutions and align capital to science-based targets. Only then can we ensure that we have a chance to avert the climate and natural capital disasters and are able to create economic and social development. We can secure a future for ourselves and our children in which both people and the nature upon which we depend can flourish. The Bank of Thailand and the Thai Banking Association are taking leadership to ensure that banks will be part of the solution to create resilience and security for Thailand and ASEAN. WWF is proud to have supported the Thai banking sector to develop these guidelines, and resources are available to support Thai banks and their clients. The Asia Sustainable Finance Initiative, or SV, mentioned by DBS this morning, was founded by WWF to provide financial institutions with best practice tools and research from science-based knowledge partners who are all operating at the cutting edge of sustainability and sustainable finance. 
We look forward to working with all of you to ensure that ASEAN banks become the lifeblood of sustainable development in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jeannie Stam. May I now turn to Dr. Majun to share with us. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, on behalf of the uh, China Green Finance Committee, which I chair, I'd like to congratulate the uh, Bank of Thailand for hosting this uh, very important forum on sustainable banking. And also my personal thanks to the governor for inviting me to attend this uh, uh, interesting and important session. As uh, Jean was uh, speaking, I was thinking, uh, basically, she described the importance of this topic. Uh, we're facing a lot of environmental challenges and climate challenge risks. And uh, uh, this leads to the question of what kind of role the financial system uh, should play in addressing these challenges. So in my talk of 15, 20 minutes, I'm not going to talk about why, because why is largely being sort of discussed. And I'll be talking uh, largely on how uh, from two perspectives. One is the China perspective. Um, we started off in 2014 um, thinking about uh, launching what we call a green financial system. So over the past five, six years, we did uh, a series of things uh, in establishing what I call a framework for green financial system. This is a major part of my talk. Then I will cover a couple of initiatives that China have promoted in international collaboration uh, which I think many of the friends here, including from Thailand and ASEAN countries, uh, can consider joining. Uh, I should point to the machine. These are two points. Uh, in 2014-15, uh, when we debated in China on uh, why we should establish what we call a green financial system, the first one was definitely the highlight at that time, because we need money. Need money to do what? To come back to uh, many polluting uh, <clears throat> uh, ch um, challenges, including air pollution. At that time, we know uh, in Beijing, the PM 2.5 was uh, around 90 on average. And that's about four times of the safe level. And uh, I was often joking during that time that someone, if you move out of Beijing and to a safer place, you know, cleaner air, uh, then he can increase his life expectancy by six years. So this is a kind of a challenge and public um, attention that we had um, in 2014 on um, why we need a you know, cleaner economy and why finance should contribute. At that time, we estimated that China needed roughly 4 trillion RMB per year to do green projects, including uh, fighting air pollution, water pollution, land contamination, protecting the forestry, and so on and so forth. Of course, part of these uh, uh, clean activities will also benefit uh, the uh, climate change effort because many of the anti-pollution um, projects at the same time will reduce carbon, uh, as well as uh, uh, saving energies. So the main target at that time was to raise money, uh, because we know out of the four trillion that's needed for clean energy, energy saving, uh, green building, green transportation, and so on and so forth, the government could only provide 10%. And 90% of the green investments that were needed need to come from the private sector. That's why we need the financial sector to work. Uh, the banks, asset managers, the insurance companies, they have to all make their efforts in driving the capital flow towards greener sectors away from the polluting and high carbon sector. Over time, we gradually realized that uh, the green finance initiative can also help uh, protect the financial system. Um, well, I just give you one example of what we did uh, through ICBC, the largest bank in China. I asked ICBC back in 2015 for them to do a stress testing, what we call environmental stress test. Namely, uh, what if you lend a lot of money to the polluting sectors, for example, coal-fired power plants, the uh, steel sector, cement sector, chemical sector, how would the uh, non-performing loan ratio look like in three years' time after the lending? And they did a stress testing showing that in all these sectors, NPL ratios will go up. Why? 
because the government will make a lot of efforts in penalizing these brown polluting high carbon sectors. And the penalty may include higher levies on pollutants, may include more aggressive enforcement on collecting the fees um, that they have to pay, and uh, may involve the introduction of a carbon trading system. And when carbon price goes up, uh, these companies will have to pay more. And all of these things put into the model will generate a forecast of NPL ratio for the banking system when they lend to the, uh, uh, the brown sectors. So by knowing in the coming few years the brown sector assets will default, these companies, these lenders will reduce their exposure to the brown sector automatically. So the two purposes now we realize one is really mobilization of new money and the other one is protecting the uh, financial system including banks. Now, what we do uh, at the government level is to create what we call ecosystem for the green uh, finance market. And that system in the document uh, which we drafted in 2016, uh, it's called Green Finance Guideline, uh, which had uh, 35 actions from seven ministries. We can sort of uh, group them into uh, four major categories or major pillars. The first pillar is what I call taxonomy or labeling. Essentially, it's a definition of green activities the financial sector have to finance. Without definition, nothing else can be done. Uh, <clears throat> the green financial system is, is groundless. And uh, the main purpose of having a taxonomy is to prevent greenwashing. Because if you don't define green activities clearly, then anybody can claim, I'm doing green stuff, raising green money. But in fact, they may be investing the money in brown sectors. Once the green finance market loses credibility, nobody's going to use the market anymore. The market cannot grow. So this is the first priority. I think it has to be done, at least in developing countries, by the government, by the regulators. If you leave it to the market, it will take decades. The second thing is about policy incentives. We know that many of these green sustainable projects still are not making enough money. Their returns are not high enough partly because externalities are not fully internalized by the current pricing system. And we're unable to fix the pricing system for now because of many, many complex issues. So what do we do uh, from a finance perspective? We can introduce some incentives, for example, by lowering the funding cost for green projects so that the return on equity of the investors will go up. And thereby, we can crowd in a um, lot more private capital into the green space. The so third one is disclosure. Um, a lot of countries have some disclosure requirements, but they are voluntary in nature. Uh, they are basically begging the private sector players, the corporates, to disclose some environmental information, but it has not been very successful. Uh, most of the countries and markets with voluntary principles have seen very little meaningful disclosure. And that's why we're moving towards mandatory disclosure, requiring the, uh, for example, green bond issuers and uh, the companies seeking green loans to disclose enough uh, information, especially the environmental um, impacts into, uh, to the financial sector players, uh, for example, the investors and also the broader markets. By doing that, um, the financial market will be able to identify who is green, who is brown, and they will be able to channel the uh, uh, green money into the right sectors. The final thing, which is a huge task of creating a series of products and tools, um, involve really collective efforts of all players in the financial system. The banks, asset managers, insurance companies have to create a series of different products that meeting the demand um, from you know, different segments of the uh, uh, real economy. Some real economy players may need uh, short-term financing uh, for green projects. That's working capital from the uh, banks, some may need long-term financing uh, to finance uh, projects with steady cash flows, for example, water treatment project or renewable energy, then we need to use the uh, green bond market. Some may require capital which can tolerate risks, uh, that's why we need uh, the green PEs and VC. Some investors, they need very liquid green assets, uh, that's why we have to create uh, green ABS, uh, green ETF, and so on and so forth. And uh, just by uh, just taking green bond as one example, the complexity of creating a green bond market uh, required in China at least uh, about 10 different government guidelines uh, to define green bond usage, 
to uh, <clears throat> require green bond issuers to disclose user proceeds, to require them to use third party verifier uh, verification services, to require verifiers to meet certain standards, and so on and so forth. And many of these documents need to be repeated by different agencies because we have three different bond markets in China and three different regulators. They have to issue different you know, rules to uh, the agencies that they regulate. So just uh, one product will require a lot of efforts from regulators. And if you need to create a 10 product market, it will be you know, like 100 um, efforts on, on creating rules and regulations. Now let me give you a little bit more specifics on what we did in these uh, four areas. One on taxonomy. In the past six years, we created the three different taxonomies. One is the uh, green credit taxonomy, essentially a definition of the areas the bank's green loans should finance. Twelve different areas. Uh, this is a very simple document uh, we put out in 2013, only one pager. The second taxonomy is the green bond catalog, which the uh, China Green Finance Committee drafted in 2015. It's a much lengthy document of 10 pages uh, with 31 categories. And uh, uh, this one was taken uh, very well by the market. Nobody complained, really, over the past three, four years. Uh, the lack of details and lack of enforceability, uh, uh, because it's detailed enough uh, for most of the verifiers to recognize which is green, which is uh, non-green. And uh, one more step that we took in 2019, this is the latest taxonomy uh, put out by NDRC, the National Development Commission, together with PBOC and other ministries, of a 60-page document of green project taxonomy with 200 subcategories. So uh, it's, I think, by March this year, by far the most detailed green taxonomy in the world. And uh, I heard the uh, EU is now creating something similar, uh, very detailed, very long documents. Uh, but I think China and EU now have the two uh, most detailed taxonomies in the world. And we're now working together on harmonizing the Chinese and EU standards on green activities. The second thing is on incentive. Uh, let me give you a couple of in examples on incentives that we uh, have used. One is uh, the green MPA, uh, which we call macro potential assessment, which uh, is a central bank tool to regulate the commercial banks. MPA uh, traditionally refers to the prudential aspects of the banks. For example, if your liquidity ratio, capital adequacy ratio are meeting standards, then you have a high score in the MPA assessment. But recently, starting from 2017, we're putting a green element into the MPA. Namely, if a bank has a high percentage of green loans and high growth rate of green loans, it gets a high score in MPA. And high score MPA may translate into monetary incentive from the central bank to the commercial banks. Um, the second facility we created at the central bank level is called green re-lending facility. Namely, the central bank provides low cost funding to commercial banks and asks commercial banks to lend also at a lower cost and market to the uh, green projects. And at a local level, uh, many local governments have offered uh, um, interest subsidies for green loans and green bonds. Um, take the uh, uh, example of the Jiangsu province. They recently announced a 30% subsidy for green bond issuance by corporates within that province. So it's a very aggressive subsidy program that uh, is designed to reduce the funding cost for green um, fund uh, raisers. And uh, I'm just giving you the last line, which is not an um, action taken, but a proposal I personally made to the Chinese Central Bank and regulator that the China should consider cutting risk weights for green loans. Part of the reason is that uh, the green loans default much less than regular loans. In the Chinese statistics, we show that uh, the green loans average NPL ratio is only 0.4% versus average banking sector loan of 1.8% NPL ratio. So clearly there is a uh, prudential basis for reducing the uh, risk of waste for green loans which are less risky uh, than brown loans. And uh, it's a proposal that's been considered and I'm looking forward to some pilot program um, before uh, moving towards a nationwide implementation. Once this is done, uh, according to my calculation, it can reduce the funding cost for all green loans by half percentage point. 
uh, it's a very, very strong incentive uh, for shifting the uh, uh, capital allocation away from brown to green. Now, on disclosure, um, <clears throat> there are many types of disclosure. For example, uh, the green loan borrowers have to disclose environmental information to banks. The green bond issuers have to disclose environmental information to the market. And uh, the banks need to disclose environmental information to the regulators, central bank and banking regulator. This is just one example of the type of disclosure the uh, bond issuer is doing to the market. Basically, uh, this bond issuer is telling the market by issuing this bond to finance a particular project, I can reduce carbon by how many tons, by reduce uh, uh, air pollution, you know, SO2 and NOx by how many tons, by uh, uh, reducing uh, solid waste by how much tons, how many tons and so on and so forth. And others may be disclosing information on energy saving, water saving and so on and so forth. And by 2020, the Chinese regulator said that we will introduce the mandatory requirement for all listed companies to disclose environmental information, which has at least requirement of seven key indicators, including carbon emission as well as other major pollutants. So by doing that, the banks and uh, capital markets will be able to identify the right green projects much more effectively. Finally, uh, just a few words on the uh, products and tools that we have developed. Um, we have a range of products and tools. Uh, here are just a few big categories, green loans, green bonds, green PE investments, and so on. And uh, uh, by now, we have about 10 trillion RMB worth of green loans, accounting for about 10% of the banking system uh, uh, loan portfolio. And uh, 900 billion RMB worth of green bonds were issued in the last uh, three and a half years. And uh, 400 green funds uh, were established in the past uh, uh, few years. You know, all these are, are huge numbers you know, relative to uh, many other countries, largely because the China economy is so large. But as a percentage of the financial system, they remain too small. Um, as I said, it's 10% of the banking system loans. It's only 2% of the bond issuance, uh, even though it's already 900 billion. And uh, uh, the 400 green funds are 1% of the fund manager industry. And what we need, in my view, is all these numbers need to go to 20% um, um, based on the definition of green activities, and they need to be 20% of the all investment activities going forward. Still a lot of room for growth going forward. Um, just uh, one word on the uh, capacity issue. I know a lot of banks are complaining that uh, we know we need to do green banking, but uh, learning how to uh, label green loans, how to price green loans, how to estimate uh, environmental impact of green loans are very, very complicated. And in China, we are now introducing the automation of green banking practice by putting these uh, practices into IT systems. And some of the local banks have now adopted such a system that can automatically label loans into green and non-green and estimate environmental impact of projects just by computer calculation. And the pricing green loans based on the greenness. Uh, if it's green, then the, the lending rates will be lower. And uh, monitoring the uh, uh, borrower's environmental performance by using AI technology, uh, searching for the environmental performance information from the market and uh, uh, the news flows automatically. And finally, reporting uh, green banking activities to the authorities by automation uh, within the IT system. Um, now, just a Couple words on international initiatives that uh, China have uh, contributed to. One is the uh, G20 Green Finance Study Group, which we launched in 2016. I had the honor to uh, co-chair this study group, uh, which essentially mainstreamed the uh, concept of green finance among global politicians. In 2016, uh, the 20 presidents uh, signed off to the uh, seven options that we proposed to scale up uh, green finance globally. And uh, in can you help me to move on? Yeah, in 2017, uh, China joined the other seven central banks in the world and uh, founded the uh, NGFS. And I had the honor to chair the uh, supervision working group of uh, this NGFS, which is now becoming a major platform for central bank and regulator to promote. Um, <clears throat> Uh, regulatory practices on uh, greening the financial system. 
And finally, just one word on the green investment principles for the Belt and Road. As you know, uh, most of the Belt and Road countries are developing countries, but they will account for the majority of infrastructure investment in the coming few decades. And we want to make sure that the new investments made in these countries are green, low carbon, and climate resilient. And they need to act, the investors need to act today in order to uh, lock in low carbon into the design and construction stage of these projects. To achieve these purposes, um, the Green Finance Committee of China and City of London jointly launched this uh, GIP or Green Investment Principles with seven uh, you know, key ideas of asking the investors to incorporate sustainability into corporate governance, um, <clears throat> measuring the environmental impact, disclosing such impact, utilizing green finance instruments, and adopting green supply chain practices. And we now have 30 large global financial institutions signed up to these principles. Um, they come from like 12 or 13 uh, different countries or regions, and they were looking for more. Uh, in fact, I was talking to governor that if you know, Thailand financial institutions are interested in joining, we'll welcome uh, them to be part of the family to promote green investment in the uh, developing world. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to uh, more discussions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marjun. Next, may I invite Ms. Sarini Ashwan Nantakun to share her insight. Okay. Hi. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, the Bank of Thailand, for inviting me to be here. The topic of my talk is um, ESG risk and Thai banks. Time to walk the talk. Um, so I'm here actually not as a South Forest um, Managing Director, but as representative of Fair Finance Thailand. So many of you may wonder who we are, because we're relatively new. So we are actually a coalition of five organizations who share the same goal, the same dream of advocating sustainable banking and fair finance practices in Thailand. So aside from South Forest, which is a research company specializing in sustainable sustainability research, we have four other members. So let me just briefly introduce them. So International Rivers is one of the world's foremost experts on river conservation. We have uh, ecolog ecological recovery and um, alert, uh, or Earth, which is uh, Thailand's uh, one of the uh, for our foremost uh, CSO civil society organization working on industrial waste um, as well as pollution. So we've done a lot of um, important research in that area. We have In Law Foundation, one of the foremost organizations that work with villagers to protect the community rights. And lastly, we have Foundation for Consumers, who is the largest um, consumer organization in Thailand. So all of us, as you can see, um, represent a broad-based stakeholders of banking sector as well as banking clients. Fair Finance Thailand is a member of Fair Finance Guide International Network. Um, and this network is also relatively new. Uh, they're not exactly 10 years old. Uh, it started in the Netherlands by Oxfam Novib. Um, currently, Thailand, we are the 10th member country. So before us, there are nine countries. Um, the aim, again, is both a network and index and tool for anyone, really, but mostly consumers and civil society to engage with the banking sector as well as regulators to to push for a more sustainable banking uh, practices. So the way we do that is every year, member country in the Fair Finance Network would publish policy assessment reports. We go through the publicly disclosed policies of various banks, um, and then we assess them on different criteria, and altogether there are over 400 criteria. So combined 10 countries, we assess over 100 financial institutions. We also publish case studies to compare the disclosed policy with the actual practice of banks. And so far, 45 case studies have been published. Fair Finance Thailand have disclosed our first um, assessment report um, just a few months ago, and you can grab our, the copies uh, on your way out and also look at our website. We plan to publish the first two case studies for Thailand um, within this year. So let's look at some relevant uh, scores under the we because now today we talk about ESG. So definitely a lot of people you've heard talk about climate change already. So under this criteria, we looked at nine largest Thai banks uh, by asset size. And the first assessment report we used disclosed information as of the end of last year, 2018. So as you can see, only two banks score in the uh, climate change categories. So both banks, Gazikon Bank and Sam Commercial Bank, receive scores for uh, disclosing that the banks are committed uh, to announce you know, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Um, SCB also got some scores for having some products to incentivize clients to switch out from fossil fuel. 
In terms of um, social risk, so one interesting risk we can look at is human rights category, which I believe will become more and more uh, in important uh, in the coming years in Thailand. So again, the same two banks, um, K Bank and ACB, Kasikon Bank and Sam Commercial Bank, score because they are the only two banks that announce they are accepting the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, or the UNGP, which is now one of the world's uh, most talked about tools to encourage how business can be uh, a part of uh, human rights um, respect and remedy uh, situation in, in situations of uh, violations. But, but I'm sure, as you can tell from the scores, both for climate change and human rights, there's a lot of room for improvements. Um, we still have yet to see how the banks will implement the UNGP, for example, in their own operations. And I think that's in line with what you've been hearing about all day, about integration of ESG into the bank's uh, operations. So a lot of people have already uh, commented on climate change, so I'm not going to uh, speak a lot uh, about that. Um, I think one good thing about coming late as a speaker is that all the, a lot of interesting points have already been made. <laughs> so, but I'm sure climate change is very, uh, a lot of people say is now um, elephant in the room. You can't really talk about environmental risk without talking about climate change. Uh, but the interesting thing from the risk, uh, from the banking risk standpoint is that there's now been a lot more research, a lot more data uh, being done to connect the dots between climate change risk and potential impacts with banking operations, with impacts on banks, businesses, and the bottom line. So this is just an example. I got this from the um, Shareholders Association in Canada. So they try to explain how climate change-related risk, for example, whether it's physical risk, reputation risk, um, and regulatory risk, can affect banks' operations, both in the retail and wholesale space, and how that can translate into business impacts for the banks, whether, whether it's through higher um, credit and default risk, or asset mispricing, or even operational losses or some cash flows impact. Um, and of course, if we see that climate change is happening already, it's just a matter of how bad it's going to get and how well we can, we can mitigate and adapt. It's not a surprise why a lot of management gurus um, say that it's no longer a CSR issue. It's no longer a corporate philanthropy issue. So let me give you an example. I'm sure everybody, everyone in the room probably knows him very well, Professor Michael Porter, you know, the guy behind Porter's Five Forces, and most recently he's been advocating CSV, creating shared value. So he said very strongly that you know, it's, it's great that companies can look at the, the climate issue as a CSR or philanthropy, but it's, not, it's no longer enough. Because now the impacts of climate is so real and so tangible and company, uh, to companies' operations that you need to address this issue from, with the toolkits of a strategist and not a philanthropist. So I think that's making a very clear uh, point. Uh, Janine already did a great job. Thank you for mentioning potential uh, impacts of climate change on Thailand. So I'm just going to give just a few examples. So the vast uh, millions of Thais still engage in um, agriculture. And so of course, if you say climate change has an impact of one of lengthening both the uh, both lengthening the drought and the severity of the drought, then that could affect our uh, yields and the length of our growing season. And that's one research that said that rice production levels along Chapraya River could decline by as much as 31% as a result of climate change. Janine already mentioned the World Bank report that talks about the potential of Bangkok being inundated uh, by 40% by the year 2030 um, under the 40 degree warming scenario. Um, but if you look at all the indices, for example, the climate risk index that um, this is produced out of Germany, Thailand is now the ninth most affected country in the last 30 years. And if you look at other indices, indices like the climate vulnerability index, we also are at the top 20 of that list. So an interesting number, uh, so this um, organization, German Watch, uh, com uh, compiled the number and data, and they said the net economic cost that we could suffer from climate change could be up to 180 billion US dollars per year between now and 2030. So let me zoom in. So it's, it's all, one, I think one challenge of when we talk about this is how to connect the dot, how to bring it down from national level, from global level, down to real operations. And you as bankers, definitely you need to know what is the real impact on the banks. So let me zoom in um, the potential of climate change on hydropower, which is an interesting industry. It's interesting because the projects tend to be large size. Um, it's greenfield. It usually requires a lot of lending. It requires multiple banks coming together in a project financing, a syndicated loan structure. So on 
you may wonder also what's the connection between climate change and hydropower. So the World Commission on Dams already many, many years ago already issued some reports on the potential impact of climate change on hydropower projects. So let me just give a few examples. Increased um, surface evaporation as well as again changing the frequency and the uh, intensity of drought could affect electricity generating capacity of dams. At the same time, you know, too little water is not good, too much water is also not good. So the potential for extreme rainfall and flood events um, as a result partly of climate change, more severe storms could affect dam operations and safety. So these are just some examples of how that could, could link together. So zooming in again from hydropower down to one specific project. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this already, Sayabri Dam. This is a large dam being built in Laos, 100% financed by Thai banks. Most of the electricity produced will be sold to Thailand. So this dam is going to go operational in a few months. I'm sure you could read a lot about the concerns and all the scrutiny uh, over the past year throughout its uh, construction. There's been a lot of uh, opposition to this. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go over that again. I just want to highlight that this dam, why is it such a, under such intense scrutiny, right? So the Mekong, how important is Mekong? Mekong is only the second biologically diverse rivers in the world after the Amazon. That's how important the Mekong is. It basically provides food and water to 60 million people. Okay, and Thayaburi is only the first of a series of dams that is going to be built along the, the main stem uh, lower Mekong. There are a lot of scrutiny, there's a lot of concerns, but if you look at how then, how do we look at risk or do we have enough information, right? The Mekong River Commission just early this year said that they don't have enough baseline information on fish, on ecology, and on sediment to make an in-depth assessment of the efficacy of the revised design. This dam, actually the operator tried to revise the design several times to try to respond to the concerns. And right now it has the largest fish pass facilities in the world uh, for, the, for a tropical river. At the same time, the project company has done no transboundary impact assessments, no modeling based on climate change, potential climate change impacts. So these are real concerns, right? So the question is, we all know we, you really cannot manage what you can't measure. So how, how can we really manage risk, uh, you know, transboundary risk when we have done no impact, uh, transboundary impact assessment? How can we manage for climate change risk when you have done no modeling on climate change? So, but if you look at the industry itself, there's some good news, and I think it's this is positive way in the right direction. Because of climate change, how big it is, and how, how uh, massive the potential impact is. Even the industry, so this is a, a document quite new, only a few years ago, sorry, a few months ago, released by the IHA, the International Hydropower Association. So this is one of the largest associations of hydropower operators. You notice the name of this. This is called the Climate Resilience Guide. So this came after the IHA already produced a number of reports calling for sustainability protocols for hydropower projects. So if you read this guide, it actually advises dam operators uh, to say for many projects, you need to take climate data and model it into a hydrological um, model before, uh, before feeding that into the hydropower model before coming up with economic forecasts and economic figures for the bankers. So this is basically saying it's not enough anymore to rely on historical data. So of course we see a lot of encouraging news from the banks um, themselves. You've heard a lot of encouraging examples already this morning. Um, so this is just an, another example. So Standard Chartered uh, came out um, very strongly. So this is uh, the chairman of Standard Chartered saying that we will no longer finance any new coal-fired power plants. We will not finance any Arctic or Amazon exploration for extractive industries. For hydropower, the bank doesn't say we would not finance any dam. The banks actually, is, what it's saying is that we expect all of our hydropower clients to comply with three uh, international standards. So they actually refer to the World Commission on Dams guidelines. They refer to the um, IHA, again, the organization that I mentioned, the International Hydropower Association's Sustainability Protocol for Hydropower, and it actually refers to the IFC, Good Practice for Hydropower. So the bank expects that all clients would go and adhere to these guidelines. Um, again, if you come, let's look at the credit and the capital markets. The more, I think more, the more that climate change and associated environmental risks become real, you know, and, and, and become a real impact on operations. 
it's no surprise why credit rating agencies and investors take notice. Um, you may have seen already, you may have heard about the stranded assets or carbon bubbles. This is just one small example. Um, S&P, which is one of the world's foremost rating agencies, if you look at their actions, actions usually meaning upgrade or downgrade of financial instruments, um, for the past few years have taken more actions based on what they call environmental or social factors. Um, in the stock market, we have seen increasing research and data being done to uh, look at ESG performance and how that is associated with financial performance. So the IFC has gone through a portfolio of over 600 companies, and they found that companies with higher environmental and social performance outperform those with worse performance. So what they found is that you know, companies with higher ENS performance outperform by 200 basis points on the return on equity and outperformed by 100, over 100 basis points on return on assets. Um, and another interesting point is that disclosure quality also matters. So companies that disclose more uh, actually seem to outperform companies that disclose less. Um, so just wrapping up, I think that it's important now, I think I hope I have made some examples to show how ESG or the real ESG identification of risk and proper management has to be seen as a bedrock or as a foundation for moving forward. So this chart is from UNEP-FI, the United Nations Environmental Program Finance Initiative. And what they're trying to advocate is that you need um, a much broader and much more clear uh, identification of risk, uh, including ESG risk, in order to reap the value, in order to see the opportunity in terms of whether it's operational efficiency or differentiation in the markets, or all the you know, uh, sustainable business model even uh, for the bank. So in other words, it's great that if you're a bank and you're financing you know, uh, green projects or if you're issuing green bonds, but all of that could be just a drop in the bucket, or it could not be very meaningful if you haven't looked at your actual loan portfolio and your existing operations and to see how much of that is exposed to ELTA risk, how much of that is exposed to climate risk, how much the bank is spurring um, projects uh, that have high risk to go on. So I think that that's why all of this have to be seen as a kind of a continuum. So value creation cannot be seen as a separate thing from ESG uh, risk identification and management. So to close, um, some of you may wonder then what should we be doing? What would be the credible approach to risk assessment, ESG risk assessment? I think that there are many things that banks can do and you've heard examples already from other speakers. I just want to highlight a few things in terms of how banks usually approach clients. So already before you go to um, clients and select them uh, for the banks, you can adopt you know, ESG criteria in your approval process. You can maybe issue negative lists or exclusion lists similar to banks that have announced that they will no, no longer finance coal and those um, similar industries. Um, then when you engage with clients, banks can be an important uh, helper. Banks can be uh, advisors to the client and try to, f try to formulate or try to frame business case of why your clients should be better managing uh, ELG risk. Um, so in a way, helping to present the business case to them. And then once you come up with the financing conditions, um, definitely look at international best practices. There are many principles, many guidelines uh, abound, um, a lot of sector-specific guidelines also that you can use. And then when it comes time to hammer out the contract and making clauses, I think here, again, you can use pricing incentives, you can use uh, mutually agreed action plans, and then think about how to better monitor um, ESG risk going forward, because better performance of the clients also is good for the bank. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rini Ashwan and Takun. May I now turn to Mr. Andrew Cross to share with us your thought. So, just to make sure that you are all awake, I'm giving you annual preparation for what I'm about to say. And I'm the sort of person that believes that I am very funny. So my inner dialogue every time I joke, I just cry with laughter internally. But so, just so you know, even if you do not laugh at my jokes, I'm finding myself very, very funny. <laughs> so. Sawadi Tonbai crap. 
Did I get anywhere close to saying successfully good afternoon in Thai? Ish? Well, you're a kind audience. All right. Um, I'd obviously like to start by thanking the Bank of Thailand for the opportunity for AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, to participate in this crucial discussion. As many of you know, AIB is essentially the new kid on the block in terms of supranational. Uh, AIB uh, was, came into existence about four years ago with 58 sovereign members. We had our annual general meeting in Luxembourg a couple of weeks ago. We now have 100 uh, sovereign members. So it's an institution that's growing very, very quickly. It's an institution that, whose name gives its business away. It's pretty obvious the assets that we are investing in or owning, either through equity or debt, are infrastructure. My role is the assistant CFO. So I have two reasons, two very compelling reasons why I want to be involved in this discussion. I have a professional reason. I have absolutely no choice but to participate in this conversation. Think about what the assets are that are coming onto the balance sheet of AIB. They're infrastructure assets. What are infrastructure assets? They are long life assets. And the other aspect which joins it to my second point is they are intergenerational assets. So we'll see if this works. So I have a very easy question for you. And all that is required is for you to put up your hands. I'm giving you plenty of warning to sit up straight, get your posture good. You ready for the question? Yes, yes, I saw that. You ready for the question? Who in this audience, and I know we're being watched outside, but I can't sort of bully them into participating. Who in this audience has a daughter, a son, a nephew, or a niece? All you have to do is put your hand up. It's not a complex math question. All right, pretty much everybody in this audience, right? I have two daughters, a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old. Infrastructure assets are intergenerational. I have a professional reason for being in this debate. I clearly have a very personal reason to be in this debate. Because if anything, all we are are the guardians between one and the next, right? So, so much of this debate, and I'm going to put my first slide up, which is, I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to sell fear. Much of this debate is fear, right? It's to, we all go to similar conversations, we read the papers, we read the reports, the world will end if we do nothing, right? Pretty much the world will end if we do nothing. This is shocking if we take no action. All right. And then on the other side of the coin is we sell hope. If we do it, then, and maybe this, this term will be particularly relevant here in Thailand, we achieve nirvana. All right. So if we do nothing, the world's going to end. If we do what we should be doing, we're going to achieve an amazing planet. And the balance is in there somewhere, right? I, I tend to agree with Dr. Marjun. I don't think the debate anymore is, should we? I think that debate actually happened a long time ago. I think the data happened a long time ago. My concern is, and I can only speak for myself, is my own personal complacency over this. So I used to work at the IFC. It's 2019. About 10 years ago, I worked with the team that issued the IFC's first green bond. So I can probably say I've participated in this dialogue for at least a decade. If I was really aware, if I'd really been following it, if I'd really been interested, I should have been participating in this debate at least 20 years ago. So when I talk to my daughters, about the opportunity I had to join AIB. Both of them said, Dad, we'd like to talk to you. We'd like to have a family conference. So I knew it was going to be serious, right? When your children want to talk to you as an adult, it's not a casual conversation, right? 
They said, we support you joining AIB, however, you have to do everything you can to support the green and environment agenda. And I'm passing on to my 15 year and 12 year old the planet that I've inherited from my parents and the contribution that I personally make. So my view is, I don't have a choice. I have to participate in this debate. I have to do things. Now some of you, if you were really awake after lunch, you will have noticed that I took a photo of the audience. I don't know if anybody spotted. All right. So of course, as far as my daughters are concerned, I as a dad have a monopoly of wisdom. Any other dad or parent in the audience, you'll all agree, we know everything as far as our children are concerned, right? However, I have taught them this phrase, trust but verify. So they said to me, their challenge to me was, you have to get involved in this, Dad. So I said, of course I will. But now I have to send photos of them to prove that I'm actually getting involved in this. So you have already helped me with part of my second point. All right. But hopefully you're hearing the serious undercurrent to this. We have no choice. I think there's also some humility that requires of us. So MDBs, regulators, policy makers, in a sense, we've grown up in a regime where boundaries are recognized. The, the challenge that we have is that the climate doesn't actually respect boundaries. It doesn't actually respect regulators. And it certainly doesn't respect the past. So the points I'm making there, I, don't, I think you can figure out, is this requires international cooperation because it's an international issue, right? The climate doesn't respect boundaries. It doesn't respect individual regulators. So if we push in somewhere, we know the consequence is going to come somewhere else. You've heard an incredible set of speakers already who have given issues, examples, cases where this cuts across, where investments cut across boundaries. And the last point is the past. If you think about the insurance industry, the way that modeling works, the way you price risk, any financial model, what's the first thing we all do? We all collect data on the past. And then maybe we do some clever extrapolation then we get some spurious science, and then we get some, um, what we think of as an accurate answer, but probably wrong. What we all know is that the changes that we're living through are happening more often, more frequently. So I read a piece of Citibank research before coming, and Citi made this point about Thailand that droughts and flooding occurring more often than they have in the past. If you modeled the insurance premiums on the past, you would underprice the risk. We have no choice. And we cannot rely on the past in terms of trying to think about how to price, how to manage risk, how to run our businesses. Right? That catch-all phrase, the past is not a predictor of the future, is most definitely true in this issue. Now, you'll forgive me, I was a bit grand. I said, we're all complacent. I can't speak for you, I admit. I was complacent. This you inherently know. When we're thinking about sustainable banking, we know that asset prices will be affected. We just don't know which assets. When you're thinking about floods and natural disasters and the impact on customers and clients and businesses, we know that assets will be impacted. We don't know which ones. And if you think of it at the beginning when I said we always talk about fear, as bankers, we probably all inherently go, what are the 
assets that are going to fall in value. However, there's also an opportunity in this conversation that some of the other speakers have talked about, which is what assets are actually going to increase. So BlackRock uh, recently published some research they did on um, the application of climate data to assets across utilities, consumer goods in the US, and have come up with some ideas around what they think is where risk is underpriced and where assets maybe have an opportunity for appreciating in value. So again, there is some science, there is some data that starts to support that this is not wholly about the downside, that there is upside for our industry. All right, this slide is just to blatantly prove that I know what the SDGs are. However, one thing that the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank does is every loan is mapped to one of these goals. And in this world, our license to operate, which I think is enormously important, not just our shareholders, but our license to operate, requires us to constantly every day prove that we are connecting our business with what really matters. So how we report data is usually financial reports. Now we have to be thinking about, for our very diverse vested interest audience, how do we prove our public license to operate, which is around trust, which is around trust but verification. All right, I don't think there's much disagreement with this. Um, the only challenge I have with this slide is I think every generation's had immense challenges. It's just part of the world that we live in. We've got some big issues about wealth transfer. We've got big issues about income disparity. And we've got big issues about where the downside falls on the most uh, fragile part of our communities. All right, beware the counterfactual. The logic of saying, but I need proof to do something, in this debate just simply doesn't work. Right? The call to action is essential. And all of the calls to action are innately really good things that we should be doing. This is the point I'm trying to make, which is for every cost or expense, there's also an opportunity. For sustainable banking, as your clients are being transitioned or thinking about how they operate in a low carbon environment, how do you think about the business opportunities, the insurance opportunities? In Thailand, people talk about micro insurance. The challenge for micro insurance, though, is the cost of the insurance. And Inevitably, there are some risks that insurance will not insure you against. And remember, you can always buy insurance, but the cost of insurance typically, if it gets to that point where it's 100% of the loss, somehow that's not insurance that you're going to buy, right? Again, it's thinking through how ES and G, is this, is this cutting in and out? Are you guys able to hear me okay? All right. This to me is pretty straightforward. When you're thinking about credit risk, how does ESG affect the ability of your borrower to repay, their desire to repay, and if they don't repay, what's going to be your loss? This is very basic credit rating analysis. But it goes to the heart of our credit business, which is around trust and where you actually put your money. So again, if you look at Thailand, Many of you would be aware that the proportion of the population that owns cars has increased dramatically. And a part of that business has been about lending to those people who can buy a car. That's raised the debate about retail being actually debt sustainability to the car. But then what's the carbon um, print? What's the impact of all of this high ownership? on loss of productivity. We were talking about this earlier today. Owning a car is not necessarily a successful step. 
I'm conscious of my time. I have four and a half minutes left. For those that are not enjoying me, you'll be delighted to hear that. So I tried to think about the impact on a central bank. And one of the things as I read the research, as I've sort of um, immersed myself in this topic, one of the things that sometimes comes up but doesn't seem to have prominence is inflation. So it's pretty straightforward that if we have, if we suffer these impacts, then asset prices could increase dramatically they could increase suddenly. And if you look at every component of CPI, pretty much every component of CPI would be affected by this. What is the general driver of central banks? It's usually inflation, monetary policy straight away. What does that mean for interest rates? Now, we're living in a historically low interest rate environment, negative interest rates. But I'm looking around the audience, and I'm sure there are people like me that remember double-digit interest rates and the impact that that can have. And also, what happens to an economy when you have high and rapid levels of inflation and what a central bank has to do to correct that. Again, think about what that means for a sustainable banking model. If your assets are not being eroded by um, physical erosion are now being eroded by inflation. So central bank response, if you look at the crises that we've had, especially in, in, um, in the world in the last few years, if you think about this, particularly in this region, 97, the currency crisis, if you think about the global financial crisis, the response by the central banks typically has been, and you heard it today, stress testing. But stress testing doesn't give you any guarantee about that's the event that will occur and that's the outcome. And then typically this response of a central bank is to say, let's increase the equity buffer. So if you're a bank in the room, you've probably seen equity increases, OECD numbers, you know, 11 to 14%. That impacts your return on equity, of course. But an increase to 40% of tier one capital does not protect you if the bank goes out of business, because then you've got 100% loss. And so this again goes to the point about fear. The rate of change is dramatic. The consequence of change is enormous now. Again, um, I can't restrain the inner economist in me. So in terms of policy making, I encourage you to think about behavioral economics. So here, in terms of the things that we want to make happen, we have to make them easy. So the obvious example is that you can increase pension growth if you force people to opt out of compulsory saving. Opting in has a much lower take up than opting out. So again, it's the application of that type of economics to the policy making that we want to do, that we should be doing. There's no choice. And as much as I would love to live in a world where voluntary things happen, I think we also know that sometimes you have to balance that with the discipline of making things happen. I think. Um, Dr. Marjun made that point, is that you cannot always rely on the market or a market solution, right? If you relied on, if you believed solely in the market, then how do we have asset bubbles? If you believe solely in the theory of efficient markets and efficient pricing, how do we have asset bubbles? And this slide, which I'm particularly proud of. All right. So what I did was I found an old poster from the Great War in Europe, 1914 to 1918. And I've blatantly plagiarized the slogan. So in 1914, 1918, the slogan was, Dad, what did you do in the Great War? And this is the symmetry of coming back to my 
point at the beginning about why am I involved in this. When you get asked, and it will be when, it won't be if, when you get asked what you did, what are you going to say? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Cross. I hope you were all inspired. Let's now proceed to the Q&A discussion. Please feel free to send in any question to the QR code pasted on the seats. We will also que welcome questions from the floor. Please raise your hand and a member of our staff will bring you the microphone. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Marc de Bourcy from the uh, Embassy of Luxembourg. Um, of course, a very uh, intriguing and interesting panel and also thank you for the Bank of Thailand organizers to uh, in invite us. Um, uh, as a journalist, of course, um, I'm very um, hesitant to, to ask a lot of questions, but my first question would go to Dr. Ma Jun, um, and it's very interesting to see uh, the policy leadership that China is, is showing uh, in this. Um, when it comes to labeling and transparency, um, or to avoid uh, greenwashing, as it might often occur, um, have you thought about also to pre and post listing? Uh, you know, often you, you want to have regular assessments, uh, post a listing. This is at least the route that my country has chosen and to try to have the utmost highest standards and also has seen China uh, being interested in the Luxembourg Sustainable Finance uh, Platform. Um, on mobilizing private investments, because you know, I think for sustainable development, you need sustainable financing for development, and therefore the private sector is key. Um, on de-risking, um, what is your um, thought in China on PPP or blended finance to have governments or multilateral development banks take the first loss, um, and therefore then also attract more uh, private uh, investors? Um, the last question would go to the EIB colleague or Sal Forest colleague uh, on ESG risks or mitigating uh, losses. Um, catastrophe bonds is nothing new, but we have seen maybe um, the re-emergence of trying to innovate on products or instruments on cat bonds. Uh, I, I would just be intrigued to, to, to hear how this could be helping in the equation of ESG risks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me try to um, tackle the first two issues. One is the uh, labeling, and uh, the second one is the mobilization of private financing through uh, de-risking. In terms of labeling, uh, we had, uh, in the banking system bond market, uh, uh, clear definitions of green finance activities. That's why labeling was made possible. Uh, as I said, in 2013, the Chinese banking regulator issued the uh, definition for green loans. So every single bank was asked to label which loan is green, which loan is not green, and they asked to report the results to the regulator, initially on the semi-annual basis, and now they are reporting uh, the uh, green loans to the authority, including the central bank and the banking regulator on a quarterly basis. Uh, this is something we began to do um, starting from 2013, and now it's being automated in many banks, including, as I showed in the example, a system uh, that's been designed by the central bank to require reporting of labeled green loans to the central bank uh, automatically. It's not universally applied yet. It's applied to a certain regional uh, pilot program, but it will be spreading to the rest of uh, uh, the banking system in China. That's the labeling on the banking side. In the bond market, uh, in 2015, the uh, regulators issued uh, the Green Bond Guideline and uh, we Green Finance Committee issued the Green Bond Catalog. So these documents provide a basis for labeling because we clearly define which project can be labeled as green, a green bond supported project. Um, such information is now public and being reported by each issuer on the website, and the many institutions are collecting such information. They tabulate them you know, in tables and uh, 
uh, you know, other forms uh, on the website. You can get such information on a monthly basis. How many green bonds are being issued by whom, in which sector, and uh, the tenor, the interest rates, and all that. It's all public information. So green bonds are labeled uh, uh, quite nicely in the past three and a half years. Now, the other green finance activities are not properly labeled yet. For example, the green funds, as I mentioned in the speech of 400 green funds, uh, these are simply self-declared green funds. They have a name of greenness in their fund. Uh, either I call this a green fund or renewable energy fund or water fund or whatever fund, and they look like a pure play, and we call them green funds. But it has not been a regulation or rules on how to define green funds. It's a very complex issue because you need to really go into the underlying assets and uh, one uh, possibility is <clears throat> to define the companies the fund is holding. And if the company is considered a green company and you have a majority of your companies being green, then the fund could be labeled as a green fund. So far, it has not been done yet. <clears throat> it's been a debate going forward. And we have not defined the green insurance yet. Um, and the many other products yet to be defined. That's why the labeling uh, is a very complex uh, issue um, and it requires a system of standards, not just one standard. As I tell the ISO uh, colleagues which are designing the uh, international uh, sustainable finance standards, we probably need 20 different standards um, for green finance and uh, they are coming out of the matrix. The matrix horizontally are the green finance products, loans, bonds, insurance, funds, listed companies and vertically we need to have a <clears throat> definition, verification, impact assessment, disclosure requirements, and something else. So it's like a like four by five matrix, and each of these elements will be a set of standards. That's how complex the eventual green finance standard system uh, will look like, but it may take five to 10 years. That's uh, my answer to your labeling question. Now, the second thing you asked about mobilization, I showed you a couple of examples of how the government or regulators can incentivize uh, private sector participation by providing uh, interest subsidies, guarantees, and uh, <clears throat> low-cost funding from the central bank. And uh, your example of blended finance is essentially a form of sort of a, 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 a risk reduction, uh, either through guarantee, uh, as you said, you know, first loss guarantee, or through um, you know, low-cost funding from the multinationals or from uh, you know, government agencies. So uh, there are all possibilities, but within China, we have not talked about blended financing that much uh, because it's uh, not involving so much of multinationals. Uh, we mainly um, rely on local uh, source of funding and uh, the local governments are the main source of cost reduction uh, in, in, in China. But when you come to international projects, definitely uh, blended financing will be a key topic. We have question at the front. Could you start, please? Hand over the microphone, please. Yeah, my name is Narong from Sanachat Bank. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what could be the measure? of success for the bank implementing this ESG strategies? Uh, let me take first cut. I'm sure my colleagues here uh, have their own views. Uh, from a bank perspective, I would say number one, uh, you need to demonstrate you are mobilizing. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, uh, the reporting of the green loans that you're extending is very important. But in order to report green loans, someone has to define green loans. Uh, so that's probably the central bank's role. You define these are the activities that green loans should finance. Then uh, a system needs to be put in place for them to report to someone, maybe reporting to the central bank initially, and, uh, or they can be disclosing to the general public. So if you can show your green loan as proportion of total loans goes up from 5% to 10% or 20% in the coming few years or decade, that's a demonstration of success. At the same time, you need to report the environmental benefits. Uh, you should not just claim I'm making green loans. You should, you should prove 
that uh, these green loans are reducing carbon, reducing wastewater, reducing energy consumption, reducing water consumption, and improving the environment. Uh, that's why the estimates of environmental impact is very important. May I add some thoughts here? So we created a sustainable banking assessment framework, and actually next week we'll be publishing the third annual assessment of 35 ASEAN banks, including all the big Thai banks, looking at the, what we constitute to be the six pillars of sustainable banking. So the first one being the purpose in terms of you know, the values, the strategy tone from the top. Right? How does that then get encapsulated in terms of robust policies that are science-based using robust multi-stakeholder-based international sustainability standards? And how do these policies then flow through into the daily processes of a bank? You know, from um, transaction approval, you know, or, or even client onboarding, you know, through to um, post-loan monitoring and what you do with non-compliant uh, clients, you know, and also in terms of the more positive side, in engaging with clients to help them to transition, you know, through uh, working on interesting financing solutions, like some of those I highlighted earlier on, and then the fourth pillar being people. So the people is twofold. One is who's in charge of the shop, right? Is the board fully mobilized? Are the board terms of reference in a bid for nomination, remuneration, audit committees, do they include any references to sustainability? Is the management empowered? Right? And are there clear roles and responsibility for sustainable banking to be filtered through to become part of how the bank operates? I think earlier speakers talked about it's not a niche, right? sustainable finance, there shouldn't be sustainable finance, it should just be all finance is sustainable. And then as well, is there adequate training and capacity building? Right, because we need this to flow through to everyone within the bank. You know, although, Andrew, you mentioned earlier that you know, the why has been answered, when we interact with many banks on the ground, we still get many questions as to why do I have to do this, if it's important, my regulator will ask me to do it, right? or it's loss making. So there's still many misconceptions, which is why I think you know, having that understanding throughout the wider organization, making capacity building compulsory from board, C-suite, through to the rest of the bank, so that everyone is empowered to take advantage of the upsides as well. And then how does this flow through into products, be it blended finance, be it green loans, green bonds, to take advantage of the upside and to shift capital to where it's needed, you know, and to also take advantage of what other incentives that could be out there um, by other, you know, other uh, policy makers. And then finally, at the portfolio level, Right. It's great to be doing green loans, green bonds, but how does the overall portfolio look? And that's where the stress testing and scenario analysis come in, not just on the green part of the portfolio, but the wider portfolio. How aligned or misaligned is the wider portfolio right, to planetary boundaries, which may sound a bit odd or a bit, a bit sort of intangible to some of you, but let me bring it down using the carbon example. Right? So what are the assets that are in, in your loan books? Right? What are you financing the assets? Are these the assets that will lead us to a three, four, five, six degree world? Or are these the assets that are needed if we want to stay well under two degrees? And, what, and hence, what you are financing will determine as well what are the risks that your loan books you know, may, may be in your loan books, but as well, what are the impacts that you are exacerbating if you continue putting money um, into certain types of activities, and then you will face that question that Andrew put up, you know, what did I do right, to try to make a change there? I think I'm going to take a, a narrower, I guess, uh, view. So I think your question, as soon as we would use the word risk management, right? so I'm not sure if the word success is a good goal to set. Because in a bank, I'm not sure if um, we say, what is the uh, you know, successful risk management? So maybe it's because if you believe that risk management has to be part of the operations already, if you believe in risk management as a core you know, banking process, you believe in continuous improvement. I think instead of looking at or asking the question, what is successful ELT risk management, maybe ask what would be the appropriate right, mechanisms for ELT risk management um, for the bank. So I think that to answer that question, it may um, go back, it may be okay to go back to what are the risk management tools already that banks are using. I think the risk management framework and uh, tools in the bank, even before we talk about ELT risk, is already changing. 
right? So there's already, for example, more rec recognition of risk management being as part of strategy, for example. Um, so I think this is not, doesn't have to be something wholly separate. So I think it's pretty much you can adopt the same risk management approach. What would be the toolkit right now that we use to identify risk? But instead of you know, going through market risk, operational risk, and all these economic risks that we are familiar with. So the, the question is more on the non-financial risk. Um, but I think at the end of the day, those identifications um, and the treatment of those risks have to be able to map, be mapped into the existing risk management framework already anyway of a bank. Um, so, so I think that it's just start with the, the mindset. I think that these researchers, you know, they're risk. So it just needs to be broadened the horizon. I think one challenge is that the, what I see is a difficulty for many banks is that when you look at ESG risk, a lot of banks will stop at compliance level, right? In other words, there's an implicit assumption that ESG risks, if they exist, are already subsumed under the relevant laws and regulations, right? So instead of looking at environmental risk, for example, you already assume, or not you, everyone, sorry, but a lot of people in the banking industry assume that, oh, then let's look at whether the client follows environmental law. And if they follow all the environmental regulation, that means it's already okay. That means that that's, so in other words, you look at compliance as a proxy for environmental risk. Social risk is similar. So if we are concerned about child labor, for example, we can say, okay, uh, is the client following the child labor regulation and the law? So the thing is, I think what a lot of um, speakers today have shown um, implicitly is that that lens of compliance is not enough because there are risks that are really above and beyond existing uh, regulations, right? No law in the world now is gonna order your clients to do uh, climate modeling, for example, uh, or even to do um, transboundary impact assessments for some projects. There are some regulations in that, moving in that regard, right? But it's still going to be playing catch up to the actual risk and impacts. So I think that, so again, I, I, my take would be instead of, you know, at putting the goal at, at the success level, maybe just move back one step and ask what would be the appropriate um, risk management we can do. And before that, what will it take for our mindset to change, for us to get away from the compliance, from the legal compliance mindset, to look at risk in a broader uh, context? Just add one word on the uh, importance of uh, analyzing and managing environmental risks. Uh, which is a topic this morning uh, Frank Edison was talking about when he um, introduced the NGFS. Uh, he said the NGFS is now compiling a handbook on environmental risk analysis by financial institutions. I am actually in charge of this uh, work. Uh, we are compiling uh, more than 20 different models from the world uh, used by banks, asset managers, academics, and third-party service providers on how to analyze on a forward-looking basis the forthcoming environmental and climate risks to the financial institutions. Um, the risks we're facing are largely non-linear. It's not something you can extrapolate from the past. And most of these risks uh, will show uh, very unexpected trajectories. So let me just give you one example uh, from one model which we did at Tsinghua University, which shows that uh, in five years' time, the non-performing loan ratio of uh, loans to the coal-fired power sector will go up to 26%. And currently, it's only 0.6%. If you extrapolate from the past few years, they probably go to only 1% or 2%. But it goes like that. Why? For a simple reason, technology change. Because the solar cost will go down every year by roughly 5%. And at that time, five years later, the solar cost will be 20% lower than coal-fired power generation. And in order to compete with solar, the coal-fired power plants have to reduce their price by 20%. And simply because of 20% reduction in price, these companies will default on the probability of 26%. So this kind of analysis is what we call the forward-looking environmental stress testing, which will be very useful for many of the bankers here because you have to foresee um, these non-linear occurrence of non-performing loans in different areas, including in the energy sector, including in these uh, 
areas where you use water intensively, for example, agriculture companies and uh, textile companies will go bust when you have a serious drought conditions because water will become so expensive. And uh, in areas where carbon is very intensive, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, steel, cement, chemical, and so on and so forth, when they generate a lot of carbon and carbon price goes up about 10 times, which is not implausible, they will go bust. So all these areas will be utilizing environmental stress testing for prevention of risks from your portfolio today. Thank you. And now we have tons of questions through the QR code. But unfortunately, we have run out of time. May I take one last question to ask our speakers? For people struggling to making a living, such as small farmers or small business, how would it close them from funding such as negative industry, help them or even convince them that this is the right way to go? And please briefly share your thoughts. Uh, let me try. We've been encountering that problem in the past few years. Because the first three years in China, when we developed a green finance system, it was largely big banks financing big infrastructure projects. As I said, you know, water treatment, solid waste treatment, um, and the renewable energy and so on, we involve billions of dollars. But uh, uh, the small farmers and the SMEs were not involved. And last two years, we began to look at that issue uh, because indeed, farming is very polluting. The majority of farming are polluting in the sense that they use too much pesticides and the fertilizers that destroy the quality of the uh, land and also are bringing serious food safety issues. And we need to change them into uh, really what we call organic farming, but it's been very difficult to label uh, what is organic and eco-farming. Um, there are two potential approaches to label uh, green farming. One is looking at the product side. Uh, basically, uh, the agriculture farm, which is sizable, they can take the products to the lab and the test uh, whether the chemical residues are below you know, certain threshold. Then we can label these products coming out of the farm as green farming then the green financing will be supporting them. And uh, this is not applying to small farmers. You know, the small farmers simply don't have the money to do the test. Then we have to approach from the input side, uh, making sure that we finance, for example, a non-chemical fertilizer through green financing at a lower cost. Um, these are the potential approach that we can address uh, you know, green financing for supporting farm. Uh, SMEs are even more difficult uh, because they do good things and bad things, brown things and uh, green things all together. Uh, it's very hard to really label which one is green, which one is brown. Uh, that's why we are now attempting to uh, develop methodology to label the company as a whole. If the company uh, delivers more than 60% revenue from the green sectors, we label them as green. So whatever financing is giving to them in terms of a working capital and so on could be labeled as green then the supporting factors will be applied to them. Uh, none of these are done yet. Uh, these are the sort of test experiments uh, which, are, which are being made uh, in some regions in China. Thank you for your question and a warm thank you to our distinguished speakers once again. We will now have a 10 minutes coffee break. Refreshments are already outside. Our next session will begin at 3.50 p.m. And we found a pair of glasses in the main room. You can collect the lost and found item at the information counter. Thank you.